Gal is truly a pioneer in the Israel LGBT movement and is a key reason for the significant progress and advances made by Israel's LGBT community. As a journalist, he has been one of the leading voices in Israel since the new media revolution in the 80s. His extensive work in the TV and film industry has contributed to the shift in, Israel, in Israeli society's view of gay people. There is no doubt that Gal has a story about Israel that you will find interesting, and you will understand why he was chosen as our first change maker. I am thrilled to join Federation in welcoming and inspiring icon to share his story with you. Before turning over the program, however, I wanted to introduce and very much thank our moderator this evening. She is Shana Weiss, distinguished visiting scholar in Israel studies at the United States Naval Academy. Please join me in welcoming Gal Luchowski and Dr. Shana Weiss. Thank you, Stuart, for, uh, and everybody here for inviting me, and thank you for your kind words. Um, it's not my first time in the U.S., but it's the first time that I've been sitting on such, under such a, a scene where my name is so big <laughs> as a social change maker. I, had to, I have to get used to it. Um, but it, I've been getting used to it in recent years because I'm, I'm, I'm becoming older. And um, I have to now, when I see the younger generations of LGBTQ people in Israel and the way everything changes, then I understand that um, I can start looking back and saying, okay, we did something, we changed something, we, it was worth it. Um, so you, you asked me about my childhood. Okay, I come from this Israel that most people, including me, think doesn't exist anymore. Um, my Grandparents from, came from Russia and from uh, Ukraine to Israel in the 1920s. My parents were both born in Israel. And um, when they were around 17, there was the War of Independence. And they uh, fled the high school to join the army. And they were kindly sent back to school. <laughs> and, and so they didn't participate in the war, which was a big thing for them that they always talked about. But they immediately joined the army after, and they became like this Israelis, righteous, beautiful, amazing uh, Israel that won the war in 67. And so I grew up in this environment that says that we are, we are right, we are here, because, we are, because of what happened in Europe in World War II and we're here to stay, and it's gonna be wonderful, and we're gonna be a wonderful nation. Um, and I really came from this part of the country that felt like elite. You know, we were all Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, we didn't know there were others. Uh, we knew they were, but we didn't really, we were not interested in them. Uh, when I was 10, my father was interested in horses, and we went horseback riding, you say? Hor yeah, horseback riding with this chief of staff of Israel at the time, Chaim Barlev. It was like, I don't know, it was, I, I, I will always remember the day and everything that he de did and everything that he said. So I was very part of it. So when I started to understand that I was gay, my first feeling was that, okay, because I'm part of everything and I'm okay, I'll be gay and it will be okay. But there was no gay when I was young. There was nothing. There were, the word didn't exist. I, I nowadays, when I, talk to younger people, I tell them, you know, it's not that there was, you know, it, it's not that they didn't have internet, grinder, uh, porn. We didn't have anything. <laughs> like, I mean, the first, the first ever gay thing that I did, I'll be very uh, careful here. The f when I was around 12, I had this friend, and his older brothers had this very old um, a newspaper magazine that had photos of girls, and we looked at it, and they were like very black and white, like sort of pixeled photos, and we looked at it together, and then we touched each other a little. This was, this was, this was everything. I mean, I never heard the word gay until like 18 or 19 or something like this. And, uh, and when I look today on all the people, all the younger people, I sort of feel that it's such a blessing that they grow up in this world that's so different. I, 
uh, yesterday we went to this group of open house in the JCC, and there were kids there, they are 15, 14, 16, and they're totally gay, and they're to some of them are open to their families and everything, and it's such a change. Um, yes. You, you want to know when I No, okay, go on. Okay. No, that's great, and that segues perfectly to the next thing I wanted to ask you, which was, as Stuart mentioned, your work with Iggy, your work with Israeli gay youth. So I know you're involved in the founding, so if you just tell us a bit how it came to be and how the organization works today in Israel and some of their activities. Okay. Um, so to answer a little more about your last question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? No, no, wait. Uh, Stuart is like trying to conduct here the conversation. <laughs> hey, we have a moderator here too. Oh, <laughs> this yeah. is Stuart, you all know him. Um, no, so the thing was that later when I, when I came to Tel Aviv as a young man in my early 20s after the army, I felt very secure about who I am. And uh, I know there are all different kinds of LGBTQ people. Are the, there are the people who, who feel um, uh, bad about it, who, had all the, who have all these thoughts, these suicidal thoughts and everything, and they feel they're different. I came from this, from this clan of LGBT people who feel that it's okay and there's not, there's not a problem about it. And this is the way I conducted myself. And, I, and then in Tel Aviv in the early 80s, I, I kind of hooked up with a few other people that were, that were feeling the same way. And we started, and together we started kind of a, of, of a behind the scenes revolution. Uh, because I don't know how much you know about the LGBTQ in Israel, but uh, the movement in Israel was not grassroots back then. Now it's very grassroots. Now it, the, the, there's a street, now there's a lot of people on, on, on Facebook who are very angry who go out and demonstrate every week. Tomorrow there'll be a demonstration in Jerusalem against some rabbi who said nasty, again, nasty things about LGBTQ and this, who said we are uh, diseased or something. But back in the 80s, most people were sort of, if not closeted, then they were like very quiet. And then the big revolution happened behind the scenes. There was a clan of journalists, of people in the know, who would talk to people and tell them, why, why are you saying the things that you are saying? For example, you were mentioning uh, um, uh, our president, Ruby Rivlin. Ruby Rivlin, our president, was the first person from the right wing to ever uh, make himself engaged with the gay community. He had a friend, somebody who already died, Menachem Shezaf, who was like um, uh, a lobbyist in the, in the Knesset. And he said to him, you know, you like me, I'm gay, why don't you come to gay events? And Ruby Rivlin, who was a very nice person back then, and he's a very great president right now, said, yes, why not? I'll come and I'll join you and I'll be part of the gay community, and I'll come to your events. I'm not sh afraid, and I'm not shy about it. And this, was, and this was at a time that only people from the far left would come to gay events and would say things like that. Anyway, you were asking about Iggy. Um, so I did a lot of things in my life. Everybody does. You just have to, be, <laughs> you just have to live long enough, and you do things. Uh, and I think the most important thing I ever did was found this organization, which is called IGI, Israeli Gay Youth. Uh, I founded it like 15 years ago with a friend called Yeni Weizmann. Uh, and I'm the, today I'm the president, he's the chairman. And it became the biggest organization of LGBTQ in Israel. It's the big, uh, I, I would say that 75% of all LGBT activities in Israel are done by this organization. And I don't know, I'm, it's amazing to see what you see when you work with these kids. It's amazing. If you go, I meet with groups every year and you see how they change. Uh, uh, like you go back 15 years and you remember this little room in this little um, uh, community center somewhere where, where word of mouth and phone would gather 20 kids or 10 kids and it was all secretive and stuff. And this, just this last year, there was, a, there, there was a, a day in the Knesset, an LGBTQ youth day in the Knesset, and there was a, a kid from Iggy, a 15-year-old transgender boy, uh, F2M. He's 15 now, his name is Ofri. He came out to his family two years ago. He came out to everybody else a year ago. And now he's, and he spoke on national TV and 
the only thing you could do is cry and sit, listen to him and cry. And he explained how life is good for him and how he's going to be uh, a change maker and how he's going to uh, um, live his life as a transgender man in Israel and do whatever he wants. Even though the situation has changed so much in the past, let's say, 20 years, what do you think are some of the still big struggles facing Iggy youth, facing Israeli LGBTQ youth today? Okay. Um, I will say something general now. When you deal with minorities, it goes to women, to Afro-Americans, to LGBTQ, Jews, there's always the, the question of what side of the equation do you point? On one hand, you have to say, you know, we still have so much to, to achieve. There's so much things that are not good enough. And on the other hand, you want to see everything that you've achieved. So it's always like this balance. That, and, and I'm, unfortunately, I'm very optimistic. So I see your faces. You've had a rough week. Uh, <laughs> you have this person now who's your, whatever you call them, president, I think. And, uh, and, <laughs> and, you know, and I've, and I've been here for a week now and I'm addicted to Fox News. I, 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 I wake up in the morning, I open it on television and I can't leave my room because it's like, you look at these people talking and you say, oh my God, this is Israel. And, <laughs> and, so, um, and so, you know, so I'm optimistic. I always say, you know, I always look at the brighter side of things. I, so when you ask me what's there to achieve in the gay community, there's a lot to achieve in the LGBT community. They're like, and you can name them one after the other, going from the fact that like, uh, the word fag is, um, is, is, is still the homo, is the, is the biggest curse in high school. On the other hand, uh, because I'm a kind of a celebrity in Israel and I do all kinds of cheap television stuff, so last year I was on a, on, a, on a reality show. It's called Gold Star, and, it's a, and the show is about taking 11 celebrities, 11 men, celebrities, and creating a soccer team out of them. <laughs> and I was the first ever gay man, not to mention that I was the oldest on the team. But this, <laughs> this, this is another story. So anyway, so just a few months ago, they, had, uh, they have this morning show where once every two weeks they interview kids about issues. So they, it was like uh, around gay pride and they brought like um, um, a few kids and they asked them, what do you think about gay marriage? And one said, uh, he was like a 10 year old, he said, uh, I saw this guy on Gold Star, he said he had a husband and it looked okay. <laughs> <laughs> And, and they said, even, what did you think? He said, he was a funny guy. He didn't play football, so he didn't play soccer so well, but he was <laughs> good enough, and he has a husband, so probably it's okay. So, so, so I, when, I, when I see this, th for me, this is like the future. This is like, this is, uh, you know, it's like when, when uh, 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 friends of mine tell me now that they're, not their kids, their grandkids, went, <laughs> went to kindergarten, and they were asked about mom and dad and what they, what did they think about families. And one of them said, uh, yeah, but not everybody has a mom and dad because God and Ethan, they are two dads. So it's not always a mom and dad. And then you say, you know, the world is changing. So I like to look at the bright side. If you want me to talk about bad things, I will. No problem. <laughs> I mean, we can't adopt in Israel. We can't, uh, we don't have uh, surrogacy in Israel. We can't, we can't actually get married inside of Israel. We have to go outside, get married, and again get registered. But it's, you know, it's an equation. Okay. Uh, something I want to, or ba based on sort of what you said before, you know, you mentioned that you grew up as part of this sort of Ashkenazi elite, which in a lot of ways sort of led the charge for the LGBTQ community. But later I think we've seen a big diversification. So I wondered if you could speak to a bit about some of the other maybe lesser known groups in Israel. Um, Mizrahi Jews, religious Jews, Israeli Palestinians, um, and sort of their struggles and how it connects to the larger movement. Well, I was born Ashkenazi. There's something I can't, this is something I will not be able to change. <laughs> although, although I'm trying, I'm, <laughs> I'm very much into uh, Sephardic Jews, which is called like uh, um, Mediterranean pop. And I, <laughs> I'm, I was even uh, um, honored enough to be a judge on this. Uh, 
kind of American Idol Israeli version of a music show that's dedicated to Sephardic music. Ayal Golan. What? Ayal Golan Koelach, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and so, uh, and of course, like, like all of Israel, we had the minorities that we didn't look, that we didn't see, that we, like, you know, it was, it was a different time. I think, I think the, the, the gay community now, some, some of the changes, okay, I have to say this. I don't really believe in empowering other people. I think that you go out, you, you're visible, you, you are there, and then people get somehow empowered and then, and then they stand up for their rights. And when this happens, it's amazing. And the big, of course, the biggest revolution now happening in the gay community is the transgender revolution. That transgender people stand up and say, this is me, this is who I am, and, and, and they stand for their rights and, and they become celebrities and they become uh, um, uh, figures that, to follow for kids and, and, and they become in, in the media and, and, and they're visible. And so, and for example, one of the nicest groups that we have now in, in our community and one of the, 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 the most interesting group is called Kala. It's a uh, um, uh, community uh, LGBT Ethiopian. And it's a group of Ethiopian um, men and women who are LGBTQ. And when you talk to them and you understand the way that they have to go and to face their community and then to face the general community, you see what, how, how, mu how much power and how much strength they need to do it. And it's amazing. Now, and you can help them, you know, you can help them do whatever you can help them. You can give them money. But until the moment that they have the power from within, to stand up for their rights, nothing happens. For example, uh, in Iggy, one of, you know, every, because I'm the president, I can come and say, why don't we do this? So, so for a few years I was saying, what about the Arab community? What about Arabs? What about Palestinians? Let's reach out for them. And it was always a problem because you don't even speak the language. You don't know how to get there. You don't know how, to, how, how would you get to the kids who live in, in Arab villages? And little by little, this, in the last couple of years, suddenly we have our volunteers. And this year, we are very proudly started a, what we call Diggy, which is a digital Iggy service. And we have, it, we have an, an, an Arab-Palestinian section that talks to the Arab kids. And, and they started like a month ago, and now we have like 100 kids there talking to them, or 200 kids talking to them. It's an amazing. And uh, um, by the way, um, uh, I will not promote my own movies, but if you're on, ne are you on Netflix? Anybody? <laughs> There's a wonderful new movie coming from Israel. It's called Oriented. It's a documentary about three gay Palestinians who live in Tel Aviv. I mean, we call them Arab Israelis. They are uh, uh, Palestinians who have uh, Israeli IDs. And it's the story of their life and how they get around in the gay community. One of them is a very funny guy, and so he gives it all of he, give it, he gives it all a very funny twist, and there's a whole, the whole thing about the fact that his grandmother doesn't care that he's gay, but she doesn't, she cannot understand why he has a Jewish boyfriend. I mean, she, she can take the gay thing because, you know, whatever, but the Jewish boyfriend, that, that's, she can, that is, this is the one thing she can't tolerate. And so, so you should watch it, it's very, very funny. I, I also just watched Oriented. It's okay. great, and I definitely recommend it to everyone in this room. Uh, speaking of the entertainment industry, I wanted to ask you um, how your sort of own story of coming out and your own um, experience with the entertainment industry, how did they intersect? How, what's your sort of relationship between your activism and between your journalistic work and also your cinematic work as well? Um, I think that when I... When I became an adult, and I became an, like an openly gay man, I, I decided within, within my heart or something, and I later phrased it like the way I'll tell it to you, that I will live my life and the world will have to change. I mean, I'm going to live the life that I want to live. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm sure that it's the right life. I'm not doing anything wrong, and the world will have to adapt. And basically, this is what happened. And so, throughout the, the years, a lot of things that happened to me, you can, 
Sometimes say they happened to you because you were gay, uh, uh, you lost a little because you were gay, they didn't give you this job because you were gay. But on the other hand, I say, but, but maybe they wouldn't have given it to me even if I was straight. I mean, uh, so, so my feeling is always that, that, that being gay is such a, you know, it's part of me and it's such a good thing. And, um, and it was part of everything and everything that I did. And so people, for example, uh, people know that you, when I was the editor-in-chief of this newspaper in Tel Aviv called Ha'ir, the city, which was at the time like the, the village voice of Tel Aviv. It was the early 90s. And I was, of course, the first openly gay uh, editor. And the publisher was for me, but then the, the local manager of the newspapers was very much against me. He was very frightened. And um, the first day I came to office, to my, to my office to, to work, somebody put a graffiti on the, a big wall next to the, to, the, to the offices saying, Ha'ir, absolutely queer. It was the time of absolute <laughs> vodka kind of thing. And, so, and I said, oh, this is funny because I'm queer and it's okay. And the, and the head of the newspaper was so taken by it that he sent somebody immediately to erase it. He said, no, 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 it will be bad for business. And I said to him, no, it's good, it's okay. It's, it's, anybody knows anyway. And he said, no, 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 it's not a good, it's not a good thing. So he raised it. So it's, so it's always like a little bit different, you know? Okay, so this is a question that was inspired by my students who watched Yossi and Jagger this semester. Uh, and in Yossi and Jagger, which probably some of you have already seen, it's this movie about two soldiers who fall in love in the IDF, who fall in love in the army. And, uh, you know, sort of, at the end of the movie, you know, no one is out. I won't give away the end of the movie, but no one is out of the closet at the end and has a sort of tragic end. So I wanted to ask you, especially in relationship with the army, um, how have things changed for the military? And sort of, and then sort of as a larger question, as a follow-up, what role do you think your movie or sort of your overall work about LGBT people in Israel had in this change? Okay, so uh, my partner Ethan Fox and I have made several movies and television series and. Uh, and of course, they're all filled with LGBTQ people. And uh, when we started doing movies like Walk on Water and The Bubble and The Ossie and Jagger and going to the Berlin Film Festival, one of the first questions people would ask would be, will all your movies have gay protagonists in them? And I found it like a very disturbing question. But then I said, you cannot just say the disturbing question, you have to find a good answer for it. And I came up with this answer. And it, when I found it, it, like it started working like a miracle. You look at this person's eyes and you say to them, so why do I have gay characters in all our movies? Well, you know, the prerogative of a filmmaker is that they take pen and pencil and then they take a lot of other stuff and they create a world for two hours, a world that hasn't been there before and is there for just for these two hours. And I'm creating this world. And why do you expect me to create a world that doesn't include me in it? And then they would go like, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> so, okay, okay, okay. So for us, when we started making movies, it was very important to put gay people in them. And uh, our first big thing was Aiden's first movie was, uh, Aiden's graduation movie was a movie called Time Off, which was the first ever movie about uh, a gay soldier coming out. Actually, it was used here and uh, it was screened on, on 60 Minutes in the, in the later when, when, when you had the no, don't tell, don't, don't ask, don't tell. Um, uh, Bob Simon came to interview us and show the clip from the movie. He paid us like more than anybody else have ever paid us for, <laughs> for a clip from a movie to show it on American television. And then in the mid-90s, we created this television series called Florentine, which was the net, there, there was a new network in Israel, and they asked us to do uh, something nice about young people, like an equivalent of friends. And we said, okay, we'll do something nice, equivalent to friends. And then we started working on it, and in the middle, of course, uh, not of course, but in the, in the middle of the process, uh, Itzhak Rabin was shot. And then we looked at each other and we said, okay, so we make something nice about young people in Israel, but Israel is not America, and you can't just have people living in an apartment with 
without any political context. So it has to be, so we integrated the murder of Yitzhak Rabin into this. And then of course we wanted, we said to the network, we have to have a, a, a gay couple in it. We have to have two gay men in it because why should we make a series? What's, the, what, what, what's it worthwhile if we, don't, if we can't show uh, two gay men on primetime television? And so in Florentine for the first time, it was, it, this was 1997, we had the first ever gay kiss on primetime television. And, it, it, and they told us that we should put the kiss towards the end of the season, <laughs> that the people will get used to the characters first, and then they, will, they, will, they can see them. So we had all the boys and the girls having sex before that in all the combinations, all the various positions. And then on the tenth ep at the end of the 10th episode, everybody went to the beach, and the guy called Tomer, who was the protagonist, and his would-be boyfriend, Iggy, his name was Iggy, <laughs> would, came to see him there, and they had a kiss. And Eitan was sitting in the editing room in Jerusalem, in the network headquarters, and all the, uh, the, all the executives, all the network's executives, came inside this little room. It was like a room like this size, and there were like 20 people there, and he was doing the editing, and they were going, okay, you have one, two, three, dissolve it. <laughs> and this is it. It's like, it's like three seconds of a kiss, and after like two seconds, you have to, this, like you see the, the, the beach and everything, it was too much. Of course, the next year they ask, yeah, why don't you do a series only about gay men? It <laughs> works so good. <laughs> it, changed a, it, it changed a lot since then, but it started like this. Okay. But your question was about Yossi and Jagger. Yes. Um, <laughs> Yossi and Jagger is also a thing that I'm very proud of because I think it's a, it was a game changer. You know, Stuart, when he talked to me about this evening, he said, you have to talk about tipping points. You have to say, to give dates that, that were there and they changed everything. And there are a few dates like this, like the, like the, uh, the, the gay kiss, the, 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 not the gay kiss, the coming out of the protagonist of Florentine during the funeral of Yitzhak Rabin to his parents, an episode number five of Florentine was a game changer in Israel. Uh, 1998, Dana International, a transgender singer winning the Eurovision for Israel was a game changer. I think Yossi and Jagger in its way was a game changer. Uh, it somehow changed because as a gay filmmaker, uh, you're always interested in, we are interested in, in, you know, in men, in masculinity, in the way the Israeli mas masculine person can work with, with being gay and with his feelings towards it. And Yossi and Jagger was taking a, like gay love and putting it, putting it in the, in the in the most sacred place of the, Israeli, uh, of the Israeli existence, which is the army. Two officers in an army base in Lebanon, and nobody knows, but they are in love. And uh, how many of you have seen the movie? Oh, okay, you're a good crowd, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, and, and the thing about Yossi and Jagger was that, that, that the fact that it, 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 there, were two, there were two things to it. First of all, it came in, at around 2000, after like 15 years where Israelis, where Israeli filmmakers did not want to make movies about the army. Because of the, like in the 60s and 70s, there were many movies about Israeli soldiers and how brave they are and how nice they are and how handsome they are and how they all have like one eye like Moshe Dayan. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but then when the Intifada started and, and, and the whole thing with the, with the occupation became more vivid, then people were not so uh, comfortable to make just simple movies about soldiers having love affairs with like girls. Because they always thought it was a political thing not to mention where they save or stuff, or stuff like that. So there, were, there, were, there was a lack of, of, of movies about the army. And when Yossi and Jagger came out, because it was a movie with no Arabs around, it was just like, it was just like an army base in the north, in the snow, and there was a, a very good description of the way soldiers talk to each other and the way they interacted with each other. So young people in Israel saw the movie and really loved it in a way that you would 
when we would stand in the outside the theater when we see them coming out, they would say something like, "Oh, you know, by the end of the movie, I was for I almost forgot that they were gay," and and the term Yossi, and the term Yossi and Jagger became such a term for like for somehow like for for male friendship for male bonding, and uh, and my, my favorite Yossi and Jagger story is this, so. Six or seven years ago, or eight years ago, we had the withdrawal from Gaza. You all know it. In 2005. In 2005. It's 11 years now, but you know, <laughs> I'm still young. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and so 11 years ago, there was the withdrawal from Gaza, and it was a very, very uh, uh, difficult process for Israel. And the two men leading it were an army officer and a, uh, and a police officer. And they were the heads of this operation. And it went very well. Nobody died in the process. There were not really many, that many riots, and it went quite smoothly. And so by the end of the year, they, became, they were nominated Men of the Year by all the magazines, and they had a big interview. And in their interview, there was this question. There's always this question. Tell us what was your most memorable, touching, intimate moment of the process. And then one of them, it was the policeman, he said this. I remember this Friday afternoon, uh, the Shabbat was coming in, the sun was coming down. We were, sitting, we were standing in this village on the ruins of everything. Everything was cleared. The synagogue was down. There was some little fires of things that were still burning. And it was just the two of us there. Everybody went away. And we were standing very close to each other. And I felt a little bit like Yossi and Jagger. <laughs> <laughs> And for me, it was the most touching thing, because when he had to think about an image of two Israeli soldiers being together and being intimate with one another, that's the only image you could think of. And I thought it was a big achievement, because first of all, he was not afraid to use them. And second, he thought that they were very nice and intimate. So. Well, I'm definitely telling my students that tomorrow morning <laughs> in the classroom. Uh, I wanted to ask you about a controversy that happened um, over the summer when I was in Israel. Uh, the uh, Tel Aviv Gay Pride Parade is this huge international event, attracts people from all over the world. And this year, there was a controversy where the LGBTQ community, as I'm sure you know, was upset with the disparity in funding from what they got for the state and then the budget for the actual parade itself, which was significantly larger. Uh, they, th they threatened to withdraw their support for the parade, and eventually the government agreed to increase the amount of funding group that these groups got, including Iggy. So I was wondering if you could speak about the sort of tensions of international tourism um, as a form of activism and sort of what's going on the ground for the Israeli LGBTQ community. So the situation in Israel in these days is very strange in a way because on the verbal level, on the level of talking, all the Likud party and all, most, most of the government of Israel is very pro-LGBT. On, in the last election, before the last election, the former deputy of uh, Minister of uh, Defense, Bogi Alon, was the strongest advocate for the gay community. He sent all these videos out saying, I believe gay people have to have a family like everybody else. They serve, they pay their money, they should have all the same rights. Which was, for Israel, it's very big because he's like the head of the army. He's like the... The, it's a the very good boogie imp what? impression, by the way. It's, it's a, a good impression, good, yeah, I say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he talks yeah. exactly I, like that. I moonlight with it, yeah. <laughs> so, so and, and Bibi Netanyahu sent out an, um, a message to the gay community, please vote for us. We have this number 30 in our uh, party, Amir Ochana. He's a wonderful guy. You should vote for me, and he will be in the Knesset. And everybody else, and they're very vocal and very uh, in their support. But when it, comes to, when it comes to daily life and then to rule and then to give money and then, then they're not, they're, it's a little different. It's a, it's a different ballgame. And so there are, all these, uh, and are, there are all these tensions between the gay community and the, and, the, and the government. And what you're talking about was that before, it was not during Great Pride, it was the, um, a little bit uh, after that the Ministry of Tourism said that they will put 11 million shekels in a campaign for bringing LGBTQ people uh, as tourists to Israel, and they will take two million shekels and paint an airplane with, 
with the rainbow flag and make Israel shine. And we were saying, fuck, the, you're, sorry. Uh, you're, you're, yeah, I mean, the, the whole money the government gives to the LGBT community is less than two million shekels. So you're now putting two million shekels on a plane. We're not going to play with you about this. And, and this, is, this, is, this is not a fair game. So there was this big riot. They had to stop it. And the good thing that came out of it is that just last a month and a half ago, uh, Moshe Kahlon, who is the Minister of, uh, fin of Finance, finance. Of yeah. finance uh, uh, decided to give 10 million shekels to the gay community uh, through, through, uh, through out all the organizations. Three uh, or four million dollars. Around three or four million dollars. Two and a half million dollars. Or two and a half million, okay. Yeah, which was, uh, actually he gave the exact amount. He said he will give him 11 million, which would okay. be the exact amount that they were supposed to put out on the stupid tourism and advertising <laughs> and, uh, and stuff. So the thing is, I mean, the, the real answer to your question is that the gay community in Israel is very, very vibrant. We're very visible in Israel. I, uh, I'm, I think we are much more visible in terms of celebrities, uh, television, uh, uh, than in America. If you open primetime television in Israel, you get ev almost every day of the week, you get the, somebody sitting who's very LGBT and who's very open about it and who tells jokes about it and who's, who's very into it. And so you have to, and, 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 uh, and all the discussion is very open. So on one hand, they don't give money, but on the other hand, we give them a hell of a time. So, <laughs> and, and we can be very nasty about it. So this is, this is basically the situation. Okay. Uh, so related to things we've discussed earlier, I wanted to ask you what you see as sort of the next steps. You mentioned a couple of them. No civil marriage, not being able to have surrogacy or adoption. Um, sort of what do you think the n next areas that LGBT should focus on in terms of their activism, in terms of making change? Well, the, the one thing we didn't mention, and I think this goes good with your question, is that the biggest change that's happening now in Israel is inside the religious communities, especially the settlers' communities. And they're having a big, uh, a, a big revolution there. And part of this revolution is that some of the, of, the, of the older rabbis and the more conservative rabbis are so concerned that they are starting to say, they are starting to say the nastiest things and really things that I didn't, don't even want to repeat on, on national television. And, on, and so there's a big fight now between, between us and them, in a way. And I, so when you ask me what are our goals for the future, the first goal is never to go back, which means never, ever to let anyone take it back, because maybe Israel is going to be more right-wing, Israel is going to be more religious, more conservative, but the gay issues, the LGBTQ issues should stay out of the game and be part of the new Israel. I mean, it might not be a very beautiful Israel, <laughs> but in terms of LGBTQ, it's gonna be okay. And then there are the little things, you know, you, you need gay marriage, you need gay, uh, gay adoption, you need gay parenting, you need more money, you need, you know, you need all the things that you need all over the world. I think Israel is not very different than, than, than America or Europe in this sense. But uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm an optimistic person and, um, that's it. Okay. So on that sense, on that note, I want to ask you, and I think this will be a sort of our last question uh, before we open it up for Q and A, is sort of, you know, what um, what do we, you know, you already started to answer it, but what can we learn about Israel from the LGBTQ community, and sort of what message can it send to the global LGBTQ community, especially LGBTQ groups in the Middle East, and sort of what role do you see this group ha having and playing on a larger global scale? Um, that's a very interesting question that I haven't thought about, <laughs> but I will think of an answer very quickly. Uh, I, think, I think the big thing in Israel is the visibility. And my personal belief is that everything the gay, the LGBT community needs is visibility. That the moment you're there and you're out and you have a face and everybody knows who you are, everything else will change with time. And so the, one, the nice thing about Israel is that in Israel, the, 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 the visibility goes so much deeper that this whole discussions about Tel Aviv being a bubble and the, only in Tel Aviv gay people go hand in hand and everybody el everywhere else, it's very hard to be gay. It's disappearing in a way. And today you have LGBT people everywhere. You have many more LGBT 
people in 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 parts of the of the of the country that you wouldn't expect them to be. Uh, you have LGBT. You even have LGBT Orthodox. I mean, my one of my favorite Iggy stories. I can close with that. Excellent. One of my favorite Iggy stories is this. Like we have a a, a yearly party where we around Purim, I think. No, ar around uh, Hanukkah where we bring like 400 kids from all over the country. In Israel, it's very simple. You put them on a bus, it's two hours from <laughs> everywhere. It's not like you have to put them on a plane and, and, and have mileage and stuff. So you, you bring, and we bring like 400, 500 kids together and they sing and dance and do something and they're very happy and they don't drink and they go home happily. So <laughs> this was like uh, seven years ago uh, and we entered the room and in the middle of the room stands this boy, and he has a white shirt and a black suit and payas. And he's a Hasidic boy. And I look at Yaniv, my Coco, and I say to him, what's that? It's a Hasidic boy, what's he doing here? He's 12. And he said, I don't know, maybe it's a costume or something. I said, yeah, but, <laughs> but it's Hanukkah, it's not Purim. And he, says, <laughs> and he says, okay, okay. So I can't stop myself. I go immediately to him and say, hi. And says, hi. And who might you be? He says, I'm Israel. And says, hi, Israel. And what are you doing here? And says, I'm gay. <laughs> and so I come to Iggy. And I said, yes, but you know, you're, do you go to a group or something? He says, no. I, there are no groups in Bnei Brak where I come from, but I heard about this event on the internet, and so I came. <laughs> and I said to him, but what are we going to do with you? He said, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. And, 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 and now we're seven years later, he's, he's okay. I mean, it wasn't an easy ride. He's, he's, he came out to his family. His family sent him to New York. They tried to send him to conversion therapy. He said, I'll go once or twice, but it wouldn't help you anyway. He's a good boy. And, then, and now he's like 18. He opened a, a, an office. He's like some consultant of something for, the, for, the, for advertising in the Hasidic market. And he's doing fine. He's, a, he's an amazing... <laughs> but, but the thing is, but you see, but you know, when I saw him, I, I said, I saw him and I saw the future. Like, he's the future. If he comes, if this guy found us and he came all by himself, then there will be, like, in 10 years, there will be 100 more. Thank you. I'm sure a lot of you have questions you want to ask Gal. So we have two microphones in either aisle. So I, I'm going to ask that you line up at the microphones, and we'll be able to take a couple of questions. All right, so we have, all right, go for it. Make sure you turn on the mic and yeah. All right. Is it working yet? Hi, just a question about, um, so during the 1990s, one thing that helped mainstream the conversation on HIV AIDS was film and cinema and song. You have, you have, to, you have to talk a little slower. Sorry. I'm a little old and here. <coughs> can you also, can you introduce yourself? Oh. Uh, my name is Justin, um, and my question is related to how film and theater and song during the HIV AIDS crisis happened in Israel. If you think about North America, films like And the Band Played On, Philadelphia, plays like Rent really helped normalize talking about HIV AIDS in North America at the time. I'm wondering if the same was done in Israel. Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, Israel was a little behind America with HIV. In, in a lot of terms, even if the, in, in, the, in the sense of like uh, people dying of AIDS and all these things. So the, the, the biggest movie that I remember is an Amos Gutman movie. He's a film, he's a very famous, he's the, he's the first ever Israeli gay filmmaker and one of the most prominent ones and he died of AIDS and his last movie was about his dying, which was a very beautiful movie. Um, I must say it didn't play a role in, in arts in Israel, the, the HIV period. It was, it was dealt by, by American products like Philadelphia, like uh, Angels in America. I mean, Angels in America was shown in theaters in Israel many times. There were many productions. Uh, it was very much appreciated, of course. I think it's the most beautiful play ever. Um, but. There, and the thing is that in Tel Aviv, it, there was never this time that I remember from New York or from San Francisco where you come and the city is like 
dying. So there was never this thing in Tel Aviv. It, it, didn't, it didn't happen. It happened very slowly, very, uh, very secretive. It was um, the whole... I don't have a good answer for that because... Um, um, I mean, I, my coming out, my coming out um, um, article in the, as a young journalist was a story I wrote for Ha'ir about, um, about the death of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a friend in New York who died of AIDS. And I, and I described all the, everything that happened and how he died. Uh, and, um, and I interviewed his boyfriend. Um, and this, and this was a cover story for Ha'ir at the time when I was still a young journalist. And this was like the first ever big uh, first-hand story about AIDS in, in Israel. But uh, we didn't have it as, as, as bad as here in, in, in a way. Nowadays, of course, all the HIV thing and is, is a whole different ball game, but this is something completely different. Okay. Is there a question over there? Okay. Do you have a happier question? <laughs> I, have a <laughs> I have a lighter question, still related to, um, to film. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your uh, um, films, perhaps from the past as well, film and television from the past as well as current that are um, not Israeli, that um, have influenced your work or um, inspire your, your work today. You're asking what kind of films inspire me? Yeah. Um, well, I'm. I'm uh, okay. So. I'd say also particularly in the gay in gay media, um, in, okay. perhaps coming from America or the UK. Well, the first movie that ever inspired me was The Sound of Music. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I don't know if the movie made me gay or vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but the thing is this: I was born, I was, I was born in Israel. But m when I was three, wo three weeks old, my parents went to Vienna. My father studied there to be a, a doc, uh, um, a veterinarian. And when I came back to Israel in the, at the age of five, I was, this, I f to my, in my eyes, I was the secret agent of Austria in Israel. I didn't was, I didn't know at the time about Hitler and everything, and that it was a bad thing. But uh, they didn't tell me, but I felt like... And so when I was seven and The Sound of Music came out, I knew it was about me. Especially because I wanted to be one of the Von Trump family, and I, uh, and I wanted to be Maria, and I wanted everything. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 and uh, by the way, last year, the Schusterman uh, Foundation took a bunch of uh, LGBT uh, Jewish leaders to Salzburg, and so I got to get my my first iPhone photo of me doing the, the Hills Are Alive yeah. things in Salzburg in, uh, on the green grass there. I didn't have the, ap I didn't have the apron, though, which is, <laughs> which is a problem. Uh, but uh, my films that, film that inspire me, I think that Angels in America that I just mentioned was one of, one of the, I think, w w was one of the most um, influential things that I saw. Um, you know, I, I grew up, you see, I'm old. I grew up in the, in the 60s and the 70s. I was inspired by, you know, Fellini, Pasolini, all kind of European movies. Um, this, is, this is where I come from. And, uh, and um, uh, actually, the, the one thing that, the, the movies made me, made me be okay with being gay because one of my really first, my first ever gay memory is that uh, I don't know how, so, how many of you have seen the movie Women in Love. Women in Love, it's a, it's a 70s movie by Ken Russell, by the late director Ken Russell. It's based on the D.H. Lawrence uh, movie. And, the sto and, and inside the story, there's, there are two men. One is like um, a farm man, like a noble farm man, Oliver Reed in a big farm. And the other man is a city poet. His name is Ellen Bates. And, they're and it's a winter night, and they're sitting in the castle, just the two of them on two chairs like this, and there's a fireplace here. And then Oliver Reed said to him, do you like to wrestle? <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he says, why not? 
And the next thing you see, they start wrestling naked, and it turns out to be the, and it turns out to be this like the, the uh, like this fire and them wrestling. And and I was 12, and I looked at it and I said, okay, so I'm not alone. It will be okay. <laughs> and then two years later, David Bowie came with Ziggy Stardust, and then I knew everything would be okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we have a question over here. Uh, you mentioned uh, some resurgence of, uh, of right-wingers, of religious uh, power, perhaps, and, and a, maybe a, a backlash against, against L LGBT uh, people. What do you think are the, the prospects for turning that around within the religious communities or for minimizing their power, that, which, which doesn't necessarily seem like a, a, a realistic long-term goal, if, uh, depending on demographics. Mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing here in the United States yeah. now uh, a similar backlash. And, and the, the well, I, I, I'll tell you two things about it. The first thing is this. Um, when I meet um, a rabbi or an Orthodox Jew, then immediately I'm winning. Because I don't care that he's an Orthodox Jew, and he cares that I'm gay. So if he talks to me, then there's already he's coming towards me, and I'm, I'm not coming towards him. I'll tell you a story, which I don't know how accurate it is, but it's a good story. Uh, <laughs> Like 10 years ago, in the, in the parade in Jerusalem, the parade in Jerusalem exists for like almost 15 years now, okay? For f the first five years, we were very quiet, nobody cared. Then one day, the religious community, the Orthodox community, decided they hate it because, they say, because the gay community said it would be an international parade. And they sent to the streets like 30,000 kids from yeshivas and everything to, to, to demonstrate against the, the parade. And there were like 10,000 policemen all over Jerusalem. It was, and it was a huge thing. The next year, again, 20,000 kids on the streets. The third year, nobody came, nobody came to riot again. And it was quiet. And there was nobody in the streets except for like maybe 50 people here, 30 people there. And people started asking what happened. And they found out that all these kids that were sent to the streets to riot against LGBTQ people came back to the, to the yeshivas and they asked, Rabbi, what are these people? What do they do? And they had to explain to them. And they had to explain to them what gay means and what lesbians means and what transgender means. And then after they started asking more and more questions, the, the, this old rabbi said, let's not send them. We don't want them to go there. Let's let them not go there. We don't want them to know anything, okay? And so, so I think that, you know, they, they will lose eventually anyway. They're not gonna, I think that, that if you look at the Western world, with all due respect to the fact that there are more and more religious people in Israel, it can't be taken backwards because it's there, because everybody knows it. And also because people, for example, the, the big revolution now in the settlements is that, the, I don't know how many of you are right-wing or not, but the settlers are this clan of people who really feel that they are right. They are the pioneers. Everything they do is right. They are the new... Uh, Sabra, they're the new face of Israel, they're the one who know what's right. So their kids grow out feeling that they are right too. And their gay kids feel the same. So when these gay kids become grown-ups, they say, okay, we're gay, you'll have to get, you'll have to recognize us. And we see it in, the, in Iggy. The groups of, of, of religious people, of settlers, are growing in, in huge numbers and in, in, in are the biggest, the fastest growing groups now. And you can't stop them. Last, last, um, last gay pride, I met, I just occasionally on the street, I met this group of young kids from Iggy. And they were all wearing the Iggy shirts. And I, when I came closer, they were like, I saw that they were only boys, which is never the case. And then I saw they had all yamakas, and I saw and so they were religious. So I started talking to them, and they were very nice. And I started asking each one, where are you from? And one said, I'm from Itzhar. It's how it's one of the most hardcore radical um, uh, settlements, a place that would not really accept me as a guest very easily. And he said, uh, and I said, so you're from there, and? And he said, yeah, I'm from there. I'm 16, it's okay. I said, what about your family? He said, they'll live with it. They'll get used to it. 
And I said, but it's Friday? And he said, yes, I'm going back with the bus in two hours. And I think he's the future. And they will win. That's the way we'll win. Hope you're right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here, we have time for one more question. So come up to the mic. <laughs> Hi, my name is Leib Kaminsky. And just wanted to ask a question if you're aware of the movements on the college campuses these days for BDS and divestment and the sort of um, the yin and yang between the gay community and the Jewish community. The, the gay community at these colleges is very pro-divestment and it's really causing a lot of troubles for young gay Jews because you, you gotta figure out where, where to go and which side to be on. Do you have any thoughts of that? Um, and, and there are people who do have the, you know, they do have a problem. Not what? everyone is okay with it. <laughs> what was the last sentence? No, no, no. I'm just saying that she shook her head. But I mean, no, I think no, a lot I, of... I'm, you know, the, 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 these two words, BDS and pinkwash, are always there and they have to be discussed. I'm not afraid of them. Um, um, Can you explain what the pinkwashing charge is for some of us who might not know? The, the pinkwash is the, the, is the, the notion that says that Israel uses the gay community to cover its crimes against the Palestinians. This is what, what right. we think pinkwash is in Israel. Um, and I don't think so. I think that um, that uh, um, Israel is a very good place for LGBT, pe LGBT people, and that uh, if the government says we are very proud of our LGBT people, it's very good for the LGBT people, and it doesn't cover up anything. It doesn't make you look, you know, it doesn't make you look brighter in anybody's eyes. The fact that you say we're LG pro LGBTQ, I don't think it helps you in any way. So if they are saying it, and I think that it has a good message when the Prime Minister of Israel stands up in the UN and says we are very proud of our LGBT community, it's good for inside Israel as well. It's the same way with the, like with the um, uh, Minister of Defense that I said before. He, says, he said for like two years, again and again, I'm for LGBTQ, and this year you have in the army two, uh, two transgender officers for the first time. So, and, it, and it's connected because he, the whole system looks at him and they understand he's pro-gay and it helps. Uh, the BDS, uh, the BDS, I don't think it's, a, it's specifically an LGBTQ issue. No, it's well, the, it's I guess the, what I'm saying is it's, but it's the LGBT community that's pushing it on a lot of these campuses and universities. So it's in direct conflict with pro-Israel Jewish values. Um, I... You see, the thing is, I'm a little conflicted about uh, BDS. I'm a, on one hand, I understand that in America, the people who really push it are really anti-Semitic. And it's not that they care about Palestinians. On the other hand, I do think that occupation is bad and that Israel's need to be shaken. And that if what you call a good president for Israel is not a president that helps Israel build settlements. So, so I'm conflicted here. In, in, in these issues, and I don't really understand the politics in the campuses in America. This is something I'm not a big expert on, but, but I know that it, it all mixes, because on one hand, the, the, the LGBTQ kids, they want to connect with Israel as Jewish and as gay. Uh, they want to be left-wing, so they're against Israel. That's it's, the conflict. It's, 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 but it's, I, I mean, That's but it. this is your problem. <laughs> You know, Thank we you. have so many problems in Israel, and most of them are unsolvable. And uh, I always say about, about the conflict, you know, if it was so simple, some smart Jew would have solved it by now. And so many tried. So it's complicated, and, uh, you know, I strongly believe in the two-state uh, two solution. I know now that it's almost impossible to reach. Uh, I'm not very optimistic about, about, about how things go, will go. I know the Israeli left is in a big, uh, is, in, is very cornered, and we need to find a new way to, to talk, the left-wing talk in Israel, because nobody listens to it anymore, and blah, blah, blah. But first of all, we didn't come here for that. And, se <laughs> and second, uh, it's, it's complicated. So the college in America, this is on your head. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we actually have time for one more question. If someone wants to come to the mic, or if we have a thing. All right, I see someone going up. Thank, great. 
Um, hey, my name is Alex, and I was just curious. You're um, the second Alex. Uh, yeah. There was another one before you. Uh -huh. um, I was just curious about, um, you mentioned earlier that um, some of the Ethiopian, um, Ethiopians in Israel, or not e Ethiopians in Israel, what you were talking about, that um, have their own sort of, um, you know, insular issues within their community. And I was wondering about the Arab uh, Israelis. Do they have separate organizations or separate insular communities through which they get support, or are they pretty well integrated into um, you know, the, the wider Israeli LGBT community. And then also, a second part, what about the um, um, LGBTQ uh, Arabs in the Palestinian territories? Are they able to access the support and resources in um, the rest of Israel, or are they kind of left to fend for themselves? I'll, I'll start from the, from, the, from the end. LGBTQ in the Gaza Strip, I don't know anything about. Nobody can penetrate there, nobody can go there. I don't know, I'm, I presume it's very bad. Uh, it's very religious there. LGBTQ in the West Bank is a little easier because they can go to Jerusalem and they can interact. Israel, uh, there is, some people try to help LGBTQ in the Palestinian territories. It's not, there, it's not like a big, there's not big aid to them. And I don't, I think their situation is not that good. Except for in, in like the big cities of Ramallah, where they're a little more out and there's a little more activity. Uh, but anyway, the, 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 the Arab community in the territories is very backward in terms of LGBTQ. Um, in Israel itself, of course, uh, so not of course, but in Israel itself, the, 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 the Arab community is a little backwards. Like for example, the, the politicians of the Arab politicians in the Knesset are people who will ne who all never vote for pro-gay stuff. They will they will not vote against, but they will not come. They will not show up. Uh, organi talking over or about organizations, there are lesbian organizations in Haifa that are very political, uh, left-wing, lesbian. They are very small organizations. In the last couple of years, there's been a, a big coming out of gay Arab men who come to live in Tel Aviv and who are very open and try to integrate. Of course, it's not very easy to be an Arab in Israel anyway. It's not, it's not very uh, easy to be an Arab person in Israel and try to integrate in the Israeli society, in the Jewish society. So for Arab gays, it's a little more difficult, although sometimes it's the fact that they are gay lets them go into the gay community in an easier way. I just mentioned this movie, and I think this movie has all your and this movie oriented has all the answers you need, and it's a very funny watch. So now that we have our homework assignment ready, uh, yes. thank you so much, and we're gonna, I'm going to hand it over to K class just for some short closing remarks. I cannot thank you enough, Gal and, and Shana. This was just beyond expectations. Just fascinating, thoughtful, insightful. Thank you both so much for leading us. And um, Gal, thank you so much for your expertise on this topic, which is ever evolving and fascinating. And thank you all for attending uh, the inaugural Meet the Changemakers. I am Kay Class, and I serve as co-chair of Federation's Israel Engagement Committee. I want to reiterate Jonathan's sentiment from the beginning uh, when he spoke tonight. We are very proud of Federation's Imagine Israel platform and so happy to share it with all of you tonight. We hope you will join us for desserts in the lobby. Um, and as we continue to develop our Imagine Israel programs, we welcome your feedback. So there will be um, cards out in the lobby and we would um, love for you to take a minute, just a minute to fill out a brief questionnaire to help us uh, moving forward, and we also welcome you to tour the Imagine Israel posters that you may have passed on your way up tonight, but they're out in the, in the dessert area now um, with pictures and brief explanations of our, our various programming. Um, and uh, you can learn about why we think it, uh, Imagine Israel is so impactful. And thank you very much for coming. <laughs>